Hello and welcome to Compounding Curiosity. I'm your host Kalani Scarrett and this podcast is all about compounding your curiosity alongside my own through thoughtful interviews with interesting guests. For transcripts and detailed show notes, check out the links in the description. Hopefully you're as keen as me to learn something new, so let's get stuck in. Alrighty, my guest today is Callum Morton-Smith. Callum is a chartered quantity surveyor with experience in Perth, London, Dubai and Saudi Arabia. In today's conversation, we cover being a quantity surveyor in the Middle East, some trends there and Callum's investment journey. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Callum Morton-Smith. Cool. Callum, cheers for being here. But before we get started, uh, maybe just tell me a bit about yourself so the listeners can have a snapshot of who you are and where you're currently living and what's your day-to-day. So thanks for having me on the pod, Kalani. Uh, Great to be here and have a chat. Uh, So yeah, look, uh, born and raised in the beautiful city of Perth, Western Australia. I've been working in the construction industry as a quantity surveyor uh, for about coming up to 10 years now, I'd say. Uh, For the past six years, I've been living overseas. first moved to London, uh, lived there for just shy of a year before moving over to Dubai and I uh, was there for maybe three and a half years and made the move from there to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And I've been there for the past two years and um, shortly I'll be uh, back to Perth to be back with family and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, could you just give me a quick breakdown of what quantity surveying is? Yeah, so quantity surveying is Basically, we act as a cost consultant to the construction and property industry. So I started out as a consultant and uh, really it involves being engaged by the architect and the client right at the start of the project. So at inception, when someone has an idea, they bring us on board and we help to prepare the sort of budget construction estimates and budget consultant fees and things like this. Uh, We work with the design team and the client right through the design phases, through concept design, schematic design, detailed design, right up to tender design. Um, Throughout this stage, the information is getting much more detailed and we're able to refine our cost estimate uh, in accordance with that. Uh, Then we go through the tendering phase. Um, We send the documents out to the contractors and they give us back their pricing. We undertake analysis of those those prices. We make a recommendation ultimately of who we think should win the project. And after that, uh, we will manage the post-contract, which is basically once, once the project's been awarded and we'll take assessments of monthly payments and variations and claims and things of this nature, ultimately all the way until handover of the project and uh, after that that's pretty much where we finish okay so the answer i've given outlines the development process from a qs perspective in its most generic form or what we call the traditional form Uh, there are so many different approaches such as design and build or what we call in australia design and construct uh, which in itself can vary in a number of different ways depending on when you engage the contractor throughout that sort of design process Under this form of procurement, the architects take the design to a less developed or less detailed stage, and this package is tended to a group of contractors who then have a responsibility to take the design from wherever the architect took it up to and uh, take it right through to the construction drawings and then also undertake the construction, hence the term design and build or design and construct. Uh, These two forms of procurement are probably the most common, uh, but in addition to that, there's so many others such as like design, build and operate, um, build, own, operate, transfer, uh, management, contracting, construction management, the list goes on. It's often the role of the quantity surveyor to recommend what route is most appropriate and to do this right at the outset, you first need to take the time an effort to really understand what the client's key objectives are. Um, We talk about the triangle of time, cost and quality and getting to know what is most important for the client in terms of these three factors, as well as understanding the size and the nature of the project, whether it's infrastructure or whether it's an office building or a house, uh, and the size and complexity of the project. All of this will uh, inform your decision of what procurement route you should ultimately go down. 
they all have their advantages and disadvantages and uh, yeah depending on the situation you've just got to weigh these up and sometimes you might even outline a number of these uh, options to your client and make your recommendation but also make them aware of what other options they have. So I explained earlier that I started out as a consultant QS and I should probably elaborate a little more on this. Uh, The QS role exists all throughout the supply chain. So you can be a QS as a supplier. Uh, Maybe you're quantifying, I don't know, let's say that you're quantifying paving, for example, (laughs) uh, as a subcontractor, as a main contractor, and as a client in-house. You know, maybe you're working for a real estate developer as a QS. Currently, I'm working as a client-side QS. So my role is a little bit different now in that I'm not uh, preparing the you know the the bills of quantities that go out for tender or the very detailed cost plans. Um, I am undertaking the early what we call rough order of magnitude estimates, and then the more detailed pieces of work are being undertaken by a consultant, and I do more of a coordinating, managing, almost quality assurance type role where I'm checking this and providing feedback. You know, back to the consultants. So that triangle you mentioned, time, cost, and quality, are you only able to pick two out of the three when doing projects? Uh, so that's a good question, actually, because what often happens is uh, the client will say, well, all of them are, <laughs> are most important, and you've really just got to stick to your guns, I guess, and say, look, you, you've got to tell me what is you know most critical for you. Sometimes it might be that... Um, you know, they need the building complete by a certain date because they've signed a contract with someone to, you know, come in and um, occupy the building. Uh, so in that case, time is your most, you know, important, you know, objective. So you might go with something like, just for example, a design and build where you can take the drawings to an earlier stage and get the contractor to complete them whilst also beginning to undertake some of the early works like the foundations. So they can start building while also finishing the design. Mm -hmm. And now obviously every client is different, but how difficult is it to push recommendations and get changes through? Is it just client management or how do you go about it? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, given my experience in Australia, the UK, UAE and Saudi Arabia, I'd say... Australia and the UK, the clients there are much more understanding and realistic. Uh, I've got to be honest, in, in UAE and Saudi Arabia, they're often not realistic. And it's, I mean, it's not really their issue. It's more so the board that oversee them. And they're answering to these guys who have given really, really tough you know, uh, targets to achieve and these guys are answering to them. So often they probably know it's not realistic, but they don't really have a choice unless they want to lose their job. And a simple question, but one that I'm curious about is how often are you dealing with clients and how much of your job is managing them or dealing with them, I guess? Yeah. So although I am working for a client now and effectively I am the client to you know, the cost consultant, I also have my in-house clients. So I treat the development management team as my ultimate client because these guys have ownership ultimately of the project. So yeah, within my organization, just as an example, you know, we must have say 30 different development managers and yeah, you can't treat each of them the same because they're all unique. They all have, you know, different uh, personalities and characteristics. So You've just got to be very wary of who you're dealing with and how they like things to be done. So a lot of it is people management. Um, Working in-house, the job actually isn't that difficult. It's much more difficult when you're working as a consultant because you need to go into much more detail. Um, Whereas now I'm relying on those guys, the consultants, to be you know, my expert. I don't need to necessarily be the expert anymore. It's more just people management. Yeah, yeah. And you don't ever have to go on site? Uh, You do if you're working in a post-contract capacity, but I'm working purely in pre-contract at the moment. So um, we do every now and then just to, you know, have a look at our projects, how they're, you know, how they're getting on. And 
it's always nice to go to site to see what you've only been up until that time, uh, you know, observing on paper in the drawings. So for sure we do, but that's more a post-contract thing. So you talked a little about pre-contract versus post-contract and could you explain further maybe specialization and what route you went down? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, early at the outset of anyone's QS career, it's pretty important to get um, exposure to both because I feel like you can't really understand what's going on in the drawings unless you've also been out to site and visualized it all you know walked around you know touch and feel what's going on on site that was certainly the case for me for the first uh, let's say four or five years Um, but pretty early on I realized that the pre-contract side of things was where I was much more interested I just found that it's it's a little more difficult actually I find it a lot more difficult and you can also be creative as well uh, and you've got to be very careful in sort of outlining your assumptions your exclusions you know the basis of what your numbers you know come from whereas post contract is more administrative and i find that it's a little bit dull for me no offense to all the guys who love post contract but yeah just for me i think it's you know you have all you have your contract there it should all be pretty black and white Uh, you've got you know you've got your templates and your processes in place for you know the post-contract administrative you know stuff whether it's payments or variations or whatever it is and it's just a matter of yeah administering it so for me it's not as difficult not as challenging and just not as interesting (laughs) So I'm curious to know, at the start of a project, how does it all begin? Does the client send you a 30-page PDF outlining what they want done, or how does it all begin? Yeah, it really depends. Uh, So sometimes, you know, whether it's a government client or a private client, or maybe it's even a someone who's not a developer per se, but they're just someone with cash who wants to, I don't know, build something. It might even be a charity. yeah, they, the expertise of the client varies uh, massively and so do their own systems and processes. So uh, they often don't come to you with, you know, a, a 30-page PDF. Um, they might just come to you and have a chat, um, usually to the architect first and get the architect to outline a maybe a vision deck, you know, roughly of uh, what, the building is based on the client's key objectives um, and based on maybe what the client has done as a business case. Uh, So, you know, they might have a site identified and they undertake a highest and best use uh, study and from that it'll determine what the mix of assets will be. Maybe it's a bit of commercial, a bit of residential, a bit of retail, maybe it's just commercial and... uh, Yeah, from there, that's when we are typically engaged. Um, As the cost consultant, you'll undertake a series of, you know, cost studies on maybe the various options that they're proposing. And from there, the design will get more and more refined based on which option works best, both from a cost perspective and also from a returns perspective. That's ultimately what the client is often looking for, is the best return. So... As we're feeding in costs, you know, the client might have a consultant or maybe they do it in-house. They'll be working out, you know, what the revenues would be and, you know, what the IRR is. So starting from scratch, how do you go about building a cost estimate? Yeah, so depending on the stage, let's just, for example, start out with a concept design stage where the design is... I mean, there is certain requirements for what concept stage should look like based on uh, REBA, the Royal Institute of uh, British Architects. But most often, you know, the design doesn't look anything like that. It might just be an area schedule. It might just be sort of blobs on a piece of paper. Uh, Or sometimes, you know, it's done in a little bit more detail and, you know, we can take off some quantities and things like that. But Personally, I think concept design stage uh, is the most difficult because there's a whole host of assumptions that you have to make. It's not just shown there on the drawings. And I think you should devote 
the most time, the most resources in the concept stage. But we often find that that's not the case. So if we just started from scratch, you know, let's just say that we've got blobs on a drawing and we're told that it's an office building. We'll work with the architect and the client to determine a certain set of parameters, like, uh, I don't know, how high is the building? Um, what's, is it going to be shell and core? Or is it going to be category A or category B? Uh, I should probably explain what that is. <laughs> Sh- shell and core is really just the the, the frame and and the box, if you like. So you've got the you've got the walls, you've got the floors, you've got the columns, you've got the beams, um, and you've got the services plugged into the common areas, but then just capped off at where the tenanted areas are going to be. Then we go category A, which is another step to that, where we have maybe the carpets and ceilings and paint to the tenanted areas and the services all plugged in, but we don't have any furniture. So that's when we go to category B, where uh, you know we include all the loose furniture, often sometimes fixed furniture as well, um, you know, things even even to the extent of paintings and artwork and uh, your IT systems or your computers and you might even have to allow for more services uh, based on where they're going to you know put all their computers and printers and all that sort of thing you know and then we determine what these you know what the client wants with respect to factors like this and we'll take those assumptions and work up a cost plan based on that so we'll start from the ground up uh, that's often the best way to do it and We'll work with whatever method of measurement is most appropriate. So it depends on on the country. Like in Australia, they use the Australian standard method of measurement. Uh, in the UK, it's often uh, NRM, which is New Rules of Measurement. And uh, in the UAE, it's it's also NRM. In Saudi, it's NRM, but um, it can get a little bit interesting. Um, there's there's a there's a bunch of different sort of uh, categories that they also include like uh, for example at the moment we're using csi to categorize all of our construction elements and yeah we we build it up from the ground up so we get whatever drawings we have and we plug it into our measurement software and we take off whatever measurements we can um, which at concept design might not be a whole lot and then we yeah, just uh, quantify, you know, we, we make our assumptions and plug those quantities in and then we build up the rates to that. So the supply rate, the uh, the installation rate, the overheads and profit, and we get these rates based, from, based on, you know, contract data, ideally, uh, most recent contract data um, to similar projects, or maybe we have tendered rates or we've built up detailed cost plans in the past. And... And that ultimately spits out a total cost, um, given that it's very early stages and depending on the information we have, we'll also allow for contingency on top of that. Um, generally, uh, the, the allowed contingency at concept design is like plus minus 30%, which is quite a lot. And often clients get really um, <laughs> uncomfortable when you plug in a 30% plus or minus at the end. But that can really be improved upon if the client works with you to refine your assumptions and gives you enough time to, you know, to, to build up a solid cost plan. So in your pre-contract role now, do you still deal with contractors? Yeah, so in a pre-contract capacity, you do still uh, liaise with contractors. Uh, if you're following a traditional procurement route, it won't be until the tendering stage. So once you've got the... Uh, the issued for construction drawings or the IFC drawings. Uh, It's gone out for tender. They're reviewing all this information and they're sending back queries. Mm -hmm. We are responding to all the queries that relate to the the bills of quantities or um, often also the contract as well. And then the architect, the engineers, they're responding to, you know, the engineering questions, the design questions. Um, once they, the contractors have submitted their tender, we then review it and we come up with a whole host of queries, concerns, um, 
we do a full side by side analysis. So we we basically build a big Excel sheet. We plug in all the contractor submissions side by side. We do like a high, low, median, um, you know, standard deviation, all that sort of thing. And um, and we send all our queries back to the contractors. And we have you know a lot of interface from then on until the point of uh, making a recommendation for award. Uh, at that point, you know, it all goes post-contract once it's awarded and whatever QS is working post-contract will then inherit uh, all those documents and they'll take it from there. But in the instance that we are doing a design and build route, we'll engage with the contractor much earlier on. Sometimes we have what's called an early contractor involvement agreement or ECI agreement and we might even get the contractor on board at concept design stage and they often act almost like a consultant uh, with the design team. Uh, so they'll be providing advice on, uh, you know, like constructability or regulations and things like that. And they'll be preparing cost plans as well as the QS or, or maybe they prepare the cost plans and we review it. And in that instance, we'll have interface with them right up until, yeah, award. And then how does payment work for the contractor? And then when does the developer see the return to? Yeah, so I can speak about the contractor first. Um, sometimes, but not always, uh, we might include an advance payment in the contract. So maybe it's 10%. Uh, it could even be 20%. And th that would be 10% or 20% of the overall contract sum. Uh, this is often used as a tool for the contractor to put a down payment on procuring long lead items. So say you've got a really tight program, but they need to order some specialist equipment. Um, I don't know, like escalators or lifts or something like this. They can place an order straight away. And, you know, that way there's not going to be delay further on because they're waiting for payment in order to afford to, to pay for them. Um, beyond that, it's typically uh, monthly. Every month uh, they'll submit a progress claim and the post-contract quantity surveyor will review it and uh, you know discuss it walk around the site and you know take measurements of what's been done and they'll undertake their own assessment and make their recommendation to the client for payment typically it's best to agree with the with the contractor before making this recommendation to the client on what to pay but it doesn't always work like that and yeah, the, depending on the contract, maybe the terms are 60 days or 30 days post that recommendation or post the contractor's claim. It depends on the contract. Uh, and that's when the client will make payment to the contractor. Often what's also included in the contract is uh, retention. So from every payment we might, or the client might withhold 5%. And that's withheld right up until the end as a form of security. Um, right up until practical completion where half of that overall retention will be released and then another half maybe 12 months later following the defects liability period. So this is where the building is finished, it's being occupied but during that 12 months or maybe it's 24 months, again it depends on the contract, the contract is still liable for any defects, you know, maybe taps aren't working properly, lights aren't working properly, things like this. Maybe there's, you know, a crappy paint job or tiles are cracked. The contractor has to come in and fix that stuff. So that's why the client withholds, you know, a little bit of money just in case the contractor might decide not to come back and say, no, stuff you are, I'm done. So that's the contractor. Uh, the client, as the developer, uh, they'll get paid. It depends a little bit as well, but okay, so let's say it's a, a retail uh, building or a commercial building where the client's often not selling, they're leasing it out. So they're only gonna make money once they've once they've signed a lease with someone. And you know, then from then on, it'll be however many years to recoup all their money. If it's a residential project where, you know, not a, not a buy to let, which is becoming more and more popular now in Australia, but you know, uh, they just wanna sell all the apartments, let's say. Uh, then they'll often recoup a lot of their money just by selling off the plan. And then once the building's complete, you know, the, the owners will have to uh, make payment for the remainder of the money, not just the 10% or 20% down payment. So it really depends on the type of development. And then a QS consultant? Uh, as, a, as a consulting QS, it, it, it varies as well in terms of when you're paid. Um, 
typically what happens is you outline a fee for concept stage, schematic stage, detailed stage, uh, tender stage, and also a post-contract fee. Maybe it's a, a monthly fee and you propose, you know, what resources you're going to include in that fee. Maybe it's uh, two senior quantity surveys and one, uh, you know, normal quantity surveyor and, you know, a few hours for a director to check it off. Um, and you'll be paid at the completion of each stage. So once the client is satisfied with your concept design cost plan, your schematic cost plan, your detailed cost plan, they'll make payment based on that. And post-contract is typically monthly, you'll get paid. And where do disputes come to this and how are they resolved? Yeah, so disputes, yeah, post-contract, it can get pretty ugly. Actually, um, yeah, the one thing about working post-contract is it is pretty fun sometimes to roll up your sleeves and have a bit of an argument with the contractor. They typically enjoy it as well. You know, we'll go into a meeting, we'll get all furious and butt heads, but after it we'll laugh and (laughs) shake hands. Um, Yeah, often, you know, most often we can come to an agreement on, you know, what is a, a fair and reasonable amount for the contractor to be paid. What's a fair and reasonable amount for a variation based on, you know, the contract documentation. In the situations where we are unable to reach an agreement, we'll have to bring in a, maybe it's a mediator at first, uh, then it might be, you know, an adjudicator, an arbitrator, maybe it goes to court. Uh, Yeah, it can get pretty ugly. And yeah, you'll see in the papers, you know, fairly often that there are big disputes that do go to court um, in the construction industry. It's contractors certainly in Australia they they work to pretty tight margins so um, yeah things can get really heated so how long does this whole process take sorry just from start to finish usually it really varies on the size and the nature of the project so I mean you could get a fast track small job that maybe the whole design takes I don't know three months and the construction might be another three months so you can go from something like that right up to a mega or what they're calling now a giga project like some of the things i'm working on in saudi arabia and these can be in planning for a couple of years and the construction can take another couple of years so uh, it really varies and education wise could you talk a little bit about the process of becoming chartered and maybe why should someone become chartered yeah so the process to become chartered uh, it depends on the body that is undertaking your assessment. The most recognized globally is the RICS or the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveys, which is who I did my chartership with. That process basically involves two, it depends on your experience level, but if you're a fresh grad, it typically involves two years of structured learning and you have to uh, complete a diary. You have to uh, complete a a case study of I think it was maybe 2,000 I think it's 3,000 words actually um, of detailing you know an experience where you demonstrated a certain competency basically and maybe a challenge that you overcame and you then have to take that case study put it in a like a PowerPoint presentation go to an interview with a panel of three chartered surveyors. There'll be a chairman and then two other assessors. You have to present your case study for 10 minutes and it's very strict on that time slot. I guess they wanna see how well you can stick to you know certain parameters. So you give your 10 minute presentation, then you're questioned on your presentation for, I think it was 10 minutes. Overall, this, in- this whole process, this, uh, this interview and presentation will go for about an hour. So you've got your 10 minute presentation, your 10 minute uh, interview on your presentation, and then there's another maybe half an hour on all the rest of your competencies. I think from memory, there's like 12 different competencies. And then 10 minutes on ethics. Uh, If you get one ethics question wrong, doesn't matter how well you did on everything else, you automatically fail. That is a seriously stressful interview. I don't think I've ever been more nervous for anything else in my life. And the feeling of coming out after it is just the biggest relief. And yeah, certainly once you get the notification that you pass, it's just like the best feeling in the world. Um, but yeah, in addition to preparing your case study and your diary, you know, right up to the lead up of the 
of the interview, you also have to complete a, I guess it's like a summary of your experience. And yeah, as I said before, I think it's 12 competencies from memory. It ranges from things like uh, business planning to accounting principles to, yeah, like cost planning, uh, building technologies. I can't remember them all off the top of my head now, but yeah, it's a pretty um, strenuous and stressful period of your life going through that. The RICS is really recognised worldwide, but you know, in Australia, we also have the AIQS or the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors. And just curious, how essential is it to be chartered in your field? Yeah, so being chartered certainly anywhere outside of Australia is very critical. You can't progress or it's very difficult to progress, at least as a consulting QS, if you're not chartered. Uh, as a contractor, it's a little bit different. You don't necessarily have to be chartered by like a body like the RICS. You might be chartered uh, through the Chartered Institute of Building or Builders. I can't remember what it is, the CIOB. Uh, or you might be like a a chartered institute of arbitrators for example because you need to be a bit more versed in contracts um, but yeah certainly as a consulting QS you you need to be chartered and through the RICS. In Australia um, you know I haven't worked as a QS there for maybe six years but when I left the RICS wasn't like the dominant body it was more AIQS and yeah certainly I think you had to be you know a member of the AIQS in order to advance your career seriously. Although I think quite a few people probably got away without it. Um, but I've seen now just on job postings and things like that, that yeah, they typically uh, require, or at least uh, it's a big advantage to be chartered through the RICS. Makes sense. So why did you originally get into the construction industry in the first place? I guess like a lot of people, uh, I followed in my dad's footsteps. So <laughs> <laughs> he was working in the industry and I found it pretty interesting and I thought, let's give it a shot. And I enjoyed the first couple of years of uni. I found it pretty interesting. I thought it's something that I could do um, until I stumbled across Rich Dad, Poor Dad by uh, <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki, as a lot of us do. Um, that was probably halfway through my studies. And from then I sort of thought, well, wow, maybe construction is not for me and I want to get into sort of finance and investing. And uh, the last couple of years of uni, I think I spent more time, you know, researching all that sort of stuff um, than I did my uni. So, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey since there. But, um, you know, what's it now? Seven years after graduating, I'm halfway through a master's degree now in banking and finance. And hopefully from there, I'll be able to progress into the sort of investment world. So you mentioned so you're studying global finance and banking at King's College. What made you choose this degree? Like, why not? You said mentioned halfway through university. Why not just switch to the time? Why do it now? And um, yeah, it just seems like a completely different avenue to what you're doing now. Yeah, I think at the time I'd already done two, maybe three years of uni, and I thought, well, I might as well finish this thing off. I'm pretty desperate to, you know, get a job and start making some money uh, to be able to actually start investing. <laughs> so uh, that was the plan, and. Um, after a year at home working in Perth, I made the move to London and actually I was looking for jobs, you know, in the investment world, but didn't have any luck and <laughs> fortunately I could transfer with the company I was with over to London. So I just did that and then things just moved so quick and, you know, lots of opportunities came up and I just stayed in the industry and, um, you know, finally after moving to Saudi Arabia where there's not a whole lot to do outside of work, uh, I decided to take up this, this master's degree and um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it and can't wait to see what opportunities it brings me once I finish. Cool, cool. So you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, what, do you remember your first investment? <laughs> I do remember my first investment. Um, I think I'll bring it to my grave because um, it was pretty profound for me. I think maybe back in the end of 2014, maybe early 2015, I'd invested in a little gold stock. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dacian Gold it was. And um, it did really well for a couple of years, actually. And I doubled down and tripled down <laughs> all of my part-time income and then full-time income at the time. And thought I was a genius because, 
maybe it went up, I don't know, 13, 14 times. And I thought, um, you know, I know what I'm doing here. I'm going to quit my job, become a day trader. <laughs> and uh, subsequently, it, um, you know, a series of bad news events came out and the stock plummeted and I held it. Uh, for a while, the old dog <laughs> I think I ended up getting out around break even. F fortunately, on its uh, upward spiral, I did sell a few shares here and there to pay for certain things and a bit of travel. So, not the worst thing in the world, but it's pretty sad to see a big green number turn into uh, <laughs> turn into a break even. So, anyway, so what were your lessons or takeaways from that then? I think uh, I probably had a lot of bias towards the stock, and I maybe became quite emotional about it and I believe too much in it and you know maybe had to take a step back and undertake more due diligence than I did and um, certainly I've tried to bring those lessons to the forefront of my mind when I'm you know investing today and uh, try to take emotions out the picture and just look at it for what it is which is easier said than done. But for sure, I think I learned some valuable lessons from that yeah. investment. So how would you describe your investing style now and how has that developed over time? It's changed over time and I think it will continue to change. Um, I've been investing for what, maybe seven or eight years now. And I think I've tried all the different methods under the sun. <laughs> um, you know, all the sort of day trading, swing trading, you know, technical analysis, fundamental analysis. Um, nowadays, I like to be more long, longer term and I've tried to build a core portfolio of, you know, diversified sort of ETFs and large cap stocks. And the intent is that I'll hold them forever. On the side, I do have some sort of satellite holdings, I guess you could say. Um, things where I find short term opportunities. Maybe I think, you know, a, a stock's been oversold and it's, there's an opportunity there for a, a rebound. And just other maybe smaller cap stocks that I think um, have some great potential. Yeah, nice. No, fair enough. Probably better for your sanity as well. It is, yeah. I can sleep easier at night yeah. now. <laughs> so you've got your holdings. What does your research process now look like then? Like, is it just more just monitoring the news and seeing what pops up? Or Yeah, so typically now I'll discover an opportunity um, by looking at the chart still. So a typical investment for me would be looking at a stock that's been completely oversold in my opinion it, the chart looks ugly and it's been sort of flatlining for quite some time and you know maybe there's been a change in management um, a, a change in direction of the strategic objectives of the company and that will make me do a deeper dive on the company and take a look at all the financials and you know now I'll do a DCF and all that sort of thing um, to come up with what I think is a sensible valuation and once the stock starts to tick up a little bit, I'll sort of combine the technicals and fundamentals now to get an entry point. And yeah, that's that's the goal now. And then I just try and hold it for, well, hopefully forever, but I do monitor it now to see, you know, whether things are fundamentally changing and then I'll, I'll look to sell or trim the position. Just curious, do you ever find paralysis by analysis? Like I'm probably the opposite. I'll probably jump in a bit too quickly, but then it's just like I commit... But how do you find that? I think I'm probably the same as you. Um, I'm not trigger shy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be nice to have a little bit more of that analysis paralysis, yeah. but I certainly jump in. I get I get really excited about um, about an opportunity that I've found and I probably think I'm much smarter than I am and I just <laughs> hop on board. So I think I'm pretty similar to you in that respect. Yeah. So how do you go about exiting then? Like, is it literally buy and hold forever or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the goal is to buy and hold forever and it's hurting me a little bit now because uh, just, well, when was it? Maybe mid sort of 2021, I'd just freshened up my portfolio because I knew that I was coming back home and there's a bunch of tax reasons for doing that. So uh, not long after that, the whole tech sort of sectors um, plummeted. And it's looking pretty ugly for me right now. <laughs> so it would have been nice to, to sell off a bit. But um, no, as I said, I like to hold forever. Um, but if there is something that I think has fundamentally changed in the company, for example, maybe the maybe the CEO and the management team are really selling off their holdings um, or maybe there's a couple of quarters of you know negative growth, whatever it might be, then I'll certainly look to trim my position.
And also something else that might make me change my position is I might find a better opportunity and I think, okay, this can, this can do maybe better than what I'm currently holding. So let's switch it up a little bit. Yeah. Not a lot of people think about that. Eh? Is there better opportunities elsewhere? But that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Opportunity costs. So. Yeah. So you touched on it a little bit there and you've mentioned what you look for, but is there anything you will not touch? Any sectors, countries? I don't think so. I think, um, yeah, as long as the numbers sort of stack up and I think, you know, the management uh, have some skin in the game and they've been with the company for quite some time, then, yeah, there's there's no real factor that will make me not invest as, as long as those, you know, parameters are there. Um, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of sort of small and micro cap companies out there that just feel pretty dodgy and uh, I try to steer clear from those but you know if if they do look promising then for sure I'll I'll have a look further yeah any mentioned dodgy anything you look for there or like you can listen in on earnings calls and things nowadays there's a few apps out there and it's interesting when they sort of try to evade the analysts questions and I just get a real sense that these guys are hiding, you know, are hiding a lot of what the truth is about how the company is performing. So I find that um, a pretty useful tool to, you know, weed out the, you know, the real... Bad actors. Yeah, the bad actors. Yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. Do you have any bias towards any certain sectors or pretty sector agnostic? No, I don't actually. And you'd think that I'd try to lead on my experience in the you know construction industry and real estate industry and maybe have a bit of bias there but I don't actually um, now I come to think of it I don't think I hold anything in the <laughs> construction or property industry so no I'm pretty open honestly I don't I don't really do a sector analysis unless I really need to rebalance my portfolio if I'm my portfolio currently is pretty well balanced but um, yeah I don't need to you know, I don't have any bias towards any sector. That's interesting. Now, you touched on the construction sector there. So you've worked in Perth, London, Dubai, and now Saudi Arabia. What have been some of the differences that you've noticed across these markets then? Yeah, they're all really different, to be honest. I mean, um, yeah, I I can only speak from living there and working in the construction industry. I don't know about the whole investment world, but Perth, uh, for me at least, was you know you work pretty hard everyone seemed to be pretty skilled at what they do moving to london i found at least for my sector and my job that the the working atmosphere was a lot easier i know there's probably some guys you know some analysts and guys who are working in the investment field and finance field now who are probably thinking what's he on about (laughs) i know they're probably working crazy hours but at least for me it was it was pretty easy going uh, moving to Dubai and Saudi Arabia as well, the, the working environment is really crazy. You work really long hours. It's really stressful. Um, clients are not forgiving and um, you work really hard. Obviously, you do make a little bit more, you know, working in those sorts of countries. So you have to, you have to earn that money. And um, yeah, it's a real work hard, sort of play hard culture. Uh, in Dubai, at least, maybe not Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia is just work hard and then try and, you know, relax and catch up on sleep on the weekend and yeah. then get back into it again. So even across projects? Yeah, so projects, it's all really different as well. There's there's different contracts, different construction methodologies. The contractors, are, you know, I mean, in Perth and in, in the UK, they're very skilled, very knowledgeable. Uh, Dubai to a lesser degree, Saudi Arabia to an even lesser degree. And, um, you know, there's there's different challenges in each market. And um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily harder in, you know, one market versus another. It's just that the challenges are, are a lot different. Cool. So for the Middle East, maybe specifically, if you're able to talk about it, in general, what types of projects are you seeing there? And like, who are the main stakeholders there? And what trends are you seeing? Yeah, so I'll speak about Saudi Arabia, because that's where I am now. And I've been there for a couple of years. Um, It's really exciting what's going on there at the moment, the public investment fund are investing a lot of money in real estate, Uh, they've set up a number of different organisations that fall underneath the public investment fund. Um, some specialize in hospitality, so big sort of hotel resort projects. 
um, through to what my company does, Russian Real Estate. We're building master plan communities for, for the Saudis. Uh, then you've got other companies that are sort of doing uh, tourism and museums and sports and anything and everything you can imagine. Um, the projects are on a really huge scale. I don't think it's been carried out in, in history. So everyone there, we're all learning. Uh, it's all you know new for us and certainly a great challenge. No, it's interesting though, because yeah, it's pretty quiet on the world news front. You know what I mean? Like you never hear people talking about it. But. Yeah, look, there's there's a few things that have been announced that sort of you might see in the media. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think that I think they're yeah they're pretty they're pretty active on LinkedIn at least. Yeah, I think Neom the line has come out recently and that's that's gained some media interest. But yeah, there's a whole lot of other stuff that's not been announced and you'll see it over the coming years. That's what a lot of a lot of us are busy on now in those sort of early planning stages of these projects. Oh, cool. So my favourite question: Do you have any interesting stories or strange strange tales you've had along the way? You obviously don't have to mention names, but if you're able to, yeah, anything interesting dealing with clients or contractors? Uh, there has been there's been quite a few interesting things, uh, to be honest, in Saudi Arabia, but I probably can't <laughs> yeah, you know, no, I probably can't right. reveal it. Um, you know, maybe we'll have a chat after the yeah. <laughs> after the podcast. Fair, Fair enough. enough. Um, so back to investing, you've talking about your style, your process, who have been your maybe mentors, heroes, or um, who have you really yeah, sponged off, I guess? Yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I guess my foray into investing, well, started off because of my, my reading of Robert Kiyosaki's books, and uh, he was a major influence for me from the beginning, but from there, obviously, we go into like Warren Buffett, Howard Marks. Um, I mean, the list goes on, yeah. uh, Benjamin Graham, and uh, yeah, sort of any any in investing book that's, you know, available, I've tried to read it, and um, I just try and absorb any little snippets of information I can. Yeah. It's yeah. funny you mentioned Rich Dad Poor Dad, because I remember, I remember reading that, that. I think that was usually one of my first, yeah. you know what I mean, making money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and by the end of the book, I was like, excuse my French, but I was like, man, just tell me what the fuck you're doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, was it was so annoying, because I, like, I was like, you've, you've spoken in big general broad terms, so I was like, yeah. get into specific what actually looking for. Yeah, exactly. Um, that was a great book, and that's what made me think, wow, like investing, I can I can be asleep in my money, just, you know, working, going up in value. So, yeah, it was a really interesting book. Your favorite investing book? That's a tough one. Um, I think it's probably not a book. It might be the Berkshire Hathaway um, Letters to Shareholders. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoy reading those. I just find so many great bits of information. Um, and it's so interesting to read all the way back to, you know, the 60s, I think, when he started posting them, you know, right up to now and just how you know, we seem to think that, you know, this has never happened before in history. And you go back to his papers early on and you can see it was happening back then as well. So, yeah, for sure, I'd, I'd find um, his his letters to be the most valuable, you know, resource for investing. And you've got a big backlog to go through. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure there's lots of other young professionals like you who have experience in a field but also have branched out into investing. Is there any advice you'd give them for those who are wanting to start but don't know where or how like i think now there's so many resources out there like you've just got to i don't know search that's the problem so much yeah. yeah true now actually you mentioned analysis paralysis before i guess trying to learn about investing you probably would have analysis paralysis now because go on youtube you know every guy and girl out there has a channel about you know how to trade and how to invest and I think I'd start off by reading this, the fundamental books, you know, read the Warren Buffett, um, what's his book, Snowball, I think, yeah. uh, read his letters, you know, read read Howard Marks, read Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, read what the professionals have to say, don't go on YouTube and listen to, you know, <laughs> all, these, all these sort of retail traders, I guess you could say. And it's um, hard as well, because if you get... All your information from them they're providing a snippet of a book but you're not getting the full thing exactly like exactly you've got to read it for yourself and get what you take away from it not the secondhand information yeah a takeaway of a takeaway that's it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so i'll move into my closing round of questions so for you personally what do you think is the most undervalued life experience that university age students don't give way to so what do you think is an underrated skill or experience you think people should have i know you've traveled but yeah i think certainly for me uh traveling has just changed my perspective massively. I think um, 
growing up in Perth, it's a small city, you get trapped in, in the bubble. And as soon as you get out of that, you just see the world from a different perspective. So I think traveling is so important and for sure we should be encouraging people to go and travel, you know, after uni um, for a couple of years at least, just to change their perspective, experience new things, meet new people, be exposed to different waves of thought. Uh, so yeah, travel for me is something I think is really undervalued. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. And besides Rich Dad, Poor Dad and all the investing books, has there been any other books that have been influential in shaping your view of the world? Yeah, I think there's a couple by uh, Tony Robbins as well. Uh, Awaken the Giant Within, I think, was a, was a really interesting book for me. Uh, it's all about personal development. He's got a couple of money books out there as well. can't remember what they're called right now. I think Unshakable is one of them. Um, also, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, that was a really interesting book. There's been loads. I can't think about them off the top of my head right now. But I mean, in addition to books, there's also podcasts. I listen to, I love listening to podcasts. Um, in addition to your podcast, I like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, <laughs> the the Huberman Lab. Um, Dan Huberman. He's the he talks all about sort of um, neurology and neuroscience and things of that nature. Uh, the old Joe Rogan. Uh, I love the old Rogan podcast. You ever done DMT? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Well, answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. <laughs> Any other pods? I think uh, Equity Mate is another good one. Another oh, finance one and investing one. Another Aussie one, which is great because... They're expanding quick too. Yeah, yeah. They're doing really well. And I think you'll find there's a lot of US content out there, but not a whole lot of Aussie content. So yeah, for sure, they're pretty good. Cool. And from a final question, what plans or vision do you have for the next five to 10 years, even just the next few years? Cause you sort of, things are changing up for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's it look like going forward? Yeah. So I'm in the process of relocating back to Perth and um, I'm working remotely for the next few months. And once I'm finished that and finish my master's, I really hope to uh, move into the into the investment world so there's a few opportunities that i'm exploring at the moment um, but first and foremost i just want to get settled in back home and sort of spend more time with family and friends you know that's the most important thing for me for now maybe combine my passion for investing and you know experience and expertise in property and you know quantity surveying and do a bit of real estate development as well um, combine my skills set with you know my brother as well he works as a <laughs> development manager so you never know maybe nice. there's something we can <laughs> we can do there in the future all right cool so yeah cheers for being on today i really appreciate it thanks, thanks a lot had a great time anything you want to plug uh no i'm pretty quiet on social media to be honest i mean uh, if you did find any of this interesting you could maybe uh, get in touch on linkedin but uh, other than that i'm yeah pretty quiet on the socials front cool. cheers that. cool thanks Kleine. no worries If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out the website compoundingpodcast.com. On the website, you'll find every episode complete with transcripts, show notes, and other related resources. If you want an email notification every time an episode releases, plus my lessons and takeaways from each episode, be sure to sign up to the Substack. So that's compoundingcuriosity.substack.com. Either way, links to all content mentioned today will be in the description below. And you can also connect with me on Twitter, at Scarrett Kalani. But until next time, have a good one.